In just a few years, the fox populations in the U.S. have increased rapidly. Millions of fox attacks in cities made farmers worried and scared. So how did they deal with them exactly? Here is the video. According to estimates by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the invasive wild fox population in the United States is currently reaching between 3.5 and 7 million animals, and this is an increasingly important problem. This population is not only scattered across the state, from peri-urban to rural areas, but is also increasingly spreading into residential areas creating major safety and economic challenges. International wild foxes, with their highly flexibility and adaptability, have chosen to move through all types of terrains, from forests, grasslands, to streets. The behavior not only increases the risk of entry into residential areas, but also poses a threat to domestic animals and human health. The breeding season of wild foxes usually begins in January and lasts until March, with each litter usually having four to six cubs. With a high reproductive rate, a female fox can give birth to up to two liters per day, leading to rapid increase in the population. These wild foxes often take advantage of holes and the fence or climb to considerable heights to penetrate residential areas. They can even jump over walls, creating consistent challenges for the community. People, to protect the livestock, often leaves food in the suburbs at night. However, this attracts wild foxes and other wildlife, increasing the risk of intrusion into people's daily lives. Wild foxes not only hunt small animals, such as rabbits, mice, and birds, but are also capable of attacking larger animals such as livestock, affecting the livestock productivity. What's more worrying is that they also carry infectious diseases such as rabies, creating health risks for both humans and animals. The process of trapping invasive wild foxes in the city is an organized and systemic process, usually carried out by authorities such as the Department of Animal Health or the Department of Forestry. This process goes beyond simply site selection and trapping and includes many important steps to ensure effectiveness in controlling and reducing invasive wild fox populations. First, determining where to place the trap is an important step. Areas where there is a high likelihood of feral foxes, such as home gardens, grounds, and landfills, are often prioritized for trapping. This process requires an in-depth understanding of wild fox behavior and ecology to optimize their attraction to traps. Next, preparing the trap is another important step. Wild fox traps are often divided into two main types, cage traps and lick traps. The cage traps works like a cage with a door that opens at the front, while the lick gripper trap uses jaws to capture the fox. The choice between these two types of traps often depends on the specific characteristics of the trap area and the ecological characteristics of wild foxes in that area. The process of setting traps does not stop at choosing the location or the type of trap, 
but also involves how to set the trap so that it attracts wild foxes most effectively. The traps should be placed in areas where wild foxes are active, such as food or shelter. Being strategic in trapping can increase the likelihood of fox capture and minimize unwanted harassments. Another important factor that affects the effectiveness of wild fox trapping is the frequency of trap checks. This is to ensure that the trap is not only effective initially, but also maintains its effectiveness over time. Checking traps at least once a day ensures that if any wild foxes are trapped, they are dealt with immediately, preventing their spread. The effectiveness of invasive wild fox trapping depends not only on technical factors, such as trap location, trap type, and inspection frequency, but also on ecological and behavioral factors of wild foxes. For an example, research by the University of California, Davis has shown that the use of cage traps can reduce feral fox populations in cities by up to 70%. This is a testament to the effectiveness of wild fox trapping strategies, especially when using methods built on extensive research and understanding of the animals. The process of hunting invasive wild fox is not just a mandate, but a comprehensive strategy designed to reduce fox populations and control encroachment. This requires diligence, careful planning, and special attention to ecological environmental factors. First and foremost, the hunting process begins with an assessment of the status of wild fox encroachment in that area. Experts must assess current populations, the extent of damage caused to the environment and agriculture, and the impact of native flora and fauna. This provides an important information base on which to build a starting plan. Planning your hunt is the next important step. During this process, hunting locations Vehicles used and safety measures are carefully determined. The goal is to ensure that hunting occurs safely and effectively while minimizing negative impacts on the environment. Choosing a hunting vehicle is an important decision depending on terrain and environmental conditions and the availability of each option. Before starting each hunting session, it is necessary to determine a specific target to avoid shooting unwanted animals. Minimizing food sources and improving habitat can help control populations over the long term. So how are invasive foxes in Australia being dealt with by farmers? Let's continue watching the rest of the video to know exactly how. The wild pigs are invasive species in the United States and pose a major threat to the country's agricultural economy. According to estimates by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, wild boars cause about $2.5 billion in damage to the U.S. agriculture each year. They are omnivores and can eat a variety of crops, including corn, wheat, soybeans, and vegetables. Wild boars can eat large amounts of crops in a short period of time. Throughout the process from sowing seeds to taking care of corn fields, American farmers are always worried about the appearance of wild boars. They can destroy an entire field of crops in just a few hours.
After checking the map in some fields to see the growth rate of the plants, it was discovered that wild boars had invaded the fields and eaten a significant amount of corn. A clear change from a green cornfield with signs of grass. After just three weeks, the white streaks appeared, which were the areas where the plants had been eaten. When moving to the field to survey the damage, many corn plants were broken and laying on the ground. The wild boar is an animal with a very high reproductive ability. The sow can give birth to 6 to 12 piglets per year, and this causes the wild boar's population to increase rapidly. Wild boars and hybrid pigs can dig holes and destroy soil. This can degrade the land and reduce its productivity. Wild boars often use their snouts to dig in the ground to find food. This behavior known as rooting is one of their most destructive habits. They get up tree roots, they destroy vegetation, disrupt soil processes, increases erosion, degrades water quality, and all of this is very costly to all the landowners. Wallowing is another negative behavior. Wild boars bask in moist areas around bodies of water to cool off and reduce insect bites. That is why large puddles of water often appear in the forests where they live. These are holes created by wild boars and rainwater. Wild boars are highly adaptable and can survive in a variety of habitat conditions, so it is not surprising that they can also colonize urban areas. In cities, wild boars use our green spaces as shelter and movement corridors. They use their noses to explore campus areas and roadside flower beds in search of food. The lawns have not remained intact since they appeared. The trash containers they pulled out polluted the area. Due to the high concentration of people, wild boar management in cities pose special challenges. The wild boars are also a threat to humans and livestock. They can attack humans and the livestock, causing injuries or failure to survive. Wild boars are very aggressive animals and can attack humans and the livestock, and this makes them the most dangerous invasive species to the American people. We're talking about diseases. All these hogs are like walking, snorting petri dishes for some nasty stuff. First up, we've got African swine fever, ASF. Now, this isn't your run of the male piggy coal. It is a rival disease that hits pigs hard. Luckily, it does not jump to humans, but it can unleash economic havoc on the pork industry. Imagine your bacon, ham, and all things swine related suddenly take a nosedive. Then there is this swine flu, not the one you're thinking of when people start coughing and sneezing. This is a different strain, and it can jump between pigs, chickens, and yes, even humans. It is like a triple threat, affecting our furry friends and us bipeds. Last but not least, 
We've got foot and mouth disease, FMD. This one is a viral party that causes mouth sores and hoof blisters in pigs, cows, buffaloes, and goats. It is like a red carpet for economic disaster in the livestock game. Animals hit by FMD cannot produce meat or milk. And you can imagine the ripple effect in the farming world. Now, here's the kicker. These diseases aren't just floating around in the air. Wild pigs, with their snuffling and hoofing around, can pick up these nasties from sick pigs or their bodily fluids. Thick slobber, dung, and urine. It is like they're walking around with a suitcase full of trouble. So what's the game plan to minimize the risk for these diseases spreading from wild pigs to our livestock? We're talking about a multi-pronged approach, folks. So how do American farmers deal with dangerous invasive animals? Let's continue watching the rest of the video to know exactly how. Historically, the duck made its debut on European shores in the 16th century, only to later traverse oceans and find a new home in South America during the 18th century. Subsequently, a significant number of these ducks, once confined to farms, stage a daring escape into the wild. creating a feral population that thrived in the untamed expanses of the continent. Adding to the complicity, some Muscovy dogs were deliberately released into the wild, whether for the pursuit of hunting or as a supplemental food for other fun. What makes the Muscovy duck particularly formidable is its remarkable adaptability not constrained by environmental boundaries, these ducks have infiltrated urban landscapes, furthering their range and influence. Compounding the challenge is their prolific reproductive capacity. These female Muscovy ducks, with astounding efficiency, lay clutches of 10 to 15 eggs with the ability to produce two to three clutches per year. As true omnivores, Muscovy ducks traverse the culinary spectrum, feasting on a diverse array of plants and animals. From aquatic vegetation to small insects, tadpoles, and even flitting birds, their diet knows little bounds. Firstly, the Muscovy duck engages in fierce competition with native species such as whistling ducks, mallards, and teal for crucial resources like food and nesting territories. This rivalry disrupts the established equilibrium of the ecosystem. Secondly, their insatiable appetite wreaks havoc on aquatic vegetations, endangering even the rarest of plant species. This poses a direct threat to the delicate balance of aquatic ecosystems. Muscovy duck knit traps plays an important role in controlling invasive musk duck populations, especially in South America. This is an effective and low-cost measure implemented simply but with high efficiency. First of all, determining when and where to place traps is crucial to achieving optimal success. The time to set traps is either in the early morning or in the late afternoon, when musk ducks are often most active. Trapping areas should be in areas 
where they feed a lot, such as ponds, lakes, swamps, and rivers. This ensures high effectiveness when traps are placed when they frequently appear. When performing the trap setting process, some things you need to pay attention to are ensuring that the trap is placed in a discrete location. Out of the sight of ducks, the trap net should be flat, not wrinkled or torn, and the bait such as rice, corn, or bran should be used to attract them into the trap. The number of ducks caught each time depends on the size of the trap and the number of ducks in the area, but usually it catches around 10 to 20 Muscovy ducks. Although the Muscovy duck net trapping method brings many advantages, such as high efficiency, low cost and ease of implementation, it also comes with disadvantages, injuries to ducks, and not being able to catch all musk ducks are a thing to watch out for. Muscovy duck hunting has become an effective control measure in reducing invasive musk duck populations, especially in areas with high duck densities and few human populations. This not only helps protect the environment, but also meets the growing needs of South America's farming and hunting communities. The musk ducks are usually active in the early morning or late afternoon, as this creates the best opportunity for hunters to catch them. Observation is an important part of the hunting process. Hunters will spend about 30 to 60 minutes observing before dawn, tracking the ducks' movements as they begin to appear. When the musk duck shows up, the hunting action begins. Hunters use guns to shoot ducks, and because they often fly in flocks, many ducks can be captured in one shot. If the duck falls into a far location or underwater, the hunter will take advantage of the support from hunting dogs. These hunting dogs are specially trained, as they will swim out in the water to harvest the ducks and bring them back to the shore. After the hunting process ends, hunters and farmers will harvest them in the fields and bring them back for pressing. This hunting method has yielded positive results for controlling musk ducks populations in South America. According to estimates, every year, South American farmers and hunters successfully hunts around 2 to 3 million musk ducks, minimizing pressure from their invasion. The benefits of hunting muscovy ducks in flooded forests are manifold. First, it minimizes competition between musk ducks and native animals, especially in competition for food and habitat. This helps protecting native animals from decline caused by the imposition of these invasive ducks. Second, this measure helps minimizing the negative impact of musk ducks on the ecosystem. Musk ducks, being omnivores, have the ability to reduce aquatic plant populations, harm aquatic animal habitats, and cause damage to agricultural production. Controlling musk duck populations through hunting is an effective way to reduce these negative impacts and protect the ecosystem. Overall, hunting muscovy ducks in the flooded forests of South America isn't only an effective measure to control the musk duck population, but also actively contributes to protecting and maintaining the natural balance in the forests, special ecosystem of the area. Wolves, a predator native to Europe and Asia, have become an increasingly serious problem in the United States. 
Initially, they were introduced into the country for hunting and recreational purposes. However, wolves' rapid adaptation to new environments has turned them into a worrying invasive species. Wolves have caused many worrying problems for the agricultural industry and local communities. One of the biggest problems is that they hunt livestock, causing loss of livestock numbers and huge economic losses for farmers. This is one of the sheep farms attacked by wolves. A series of injured sheep lay on the floor. In addition, the appearance of wolves also causes confusion and anxiety in the local community. People living in the wolf-infested areas often face mental and financial pressure, and they do feel unsafe in their daily lives. However, to deal with this problem, there are many measures that can be taken. Trapping is a traditional method used to capture wolves and control their numbers in specific areas. In addition, hunting wolves is an effective method to reduce their existence in the wild, although environmental protection regulations must be followed. Furthermore, farms can implement increased security measures such as building fences, using flawed lights, and hunting dogs to prevent wolves from entering their areas. This helps protect livestock and crops from coyote attacks, while also creating a safer environment for communities. Monkeys are also one of the invasive species whose population are rapidly increasing. They are present everywhere on the streets. They attack people in tourist areas and beaches. Monkeys can transmit infectious diseases to humans and other animals through close contact. This creates a threat to the health of humans and wildlife. Fruits and agricultural products are also greatly damaged by this species. They are one of the most intelligent and agile species. A sudden increase in monkey population could cause many problems for humans in agriculture. The attack and destroy farms, causing economic loss and scaring local communities. Monkey hunting may become a necessary solution to control this situation. Monkey hunting can protect farms from their destruction, ensure food sources for the community and maintain a stable economic life. In addition, controlling the monkey population also helps prevent disease transmission and protect human health. However, monkey hunting needs to follow regulations and rules on environmental and wildlife protection. This ensures sustainability and protects other animals from being affected. Next, we have wild boars. The wild boar is a mammal originating from Europe and it was present in the United States for the original purpose of hunting and entertainment. However, no one could have imagined that wild boars quickly adapted to the new environment and became one of the invasive species of concern in the country. The adaptation not only benefits them, but also causes many problems for agriculture and environment. 
Wild boars often destroy crops and orchards, reducing productivity and harvests for farmers. This vandalism not only causes economic loss, but also threatens the community's food source. In addition to stealing food from farms, they also compete with wild animals, causing damage to the ecological system. The adaptation of wild boars isn't limited to destroying crops, but is also related to the environmental pollution. They often have difficulty disposing of waste, and their waste can pollute the environment and harm water sources. To control wild boar numbers and reduce their impact, there are numbers of measures that can be taken. Using traps is a traditional method of catching wild boars, helping to control their numbers in specific areas. In addition, hunting wild boars is also an effective method to reduce their existence in the wild. However, this needs to comply with regulations and rules on environmental and wildlife protection. It should be noted that controlling the wild boar population needs to be done in a considered manner to ensure sustainability and protect other animal species from being affected. At the same time, it is necessary to research and apply other solutions to protect the natural environment in agriculture to deal with this problem. So despite having wild boars originating for recreational and hunting purposes, but they have become a worrying threat to agriculture and environment. Managing and controlling their numbers is an important task to protect their lives and livelihoods. So what do you think about the American way of dealing with wild boars? Please comment below in the comment section to let us know. And for now, let's continue watching the rest of the video. Three million feral cats first appeared in the world in 1850s to date the number of feral cats in Australia. An estimated 1.4 to 6.3 million feral cats have become a hunting name for Australians. They were originally introduced to Australia as pets and to control rats. However, when they become feral cats, they become uncontrollable and begin to hunt their natural prey, causing ecological imbalance. So what is the reason of why the number of feral cat populations has increased so much. Feral cat populations can sustain themselves and reproduce successfully thanks to the abundant food sources, with females giving birth on average twice per year, the first time in the spring, and the second will be in late summer and early fall under favorable conditions. Kittens will stay with their mother until about seven months old. They disperse and live alone. These individuals give birth to dozens of different litters for feral cats that invade all of Australia. When the number of feral cats increases, suddenly leads to a lack of food. To deal with invasive feral cats, Australian stakes some of the following countermeasures. 
Are you surprised that feral cats are taken down with hunting equipment? Taking down feral cats at night is a complex process that requires careful preparation and necessary skills. To begin with, the use of devices such as infrared glasses and flashlights is necessary to find the location of stray cats in the dark. The cat's shooting distance at night is 0.4x. To hit a cat, the shooter needs to reach this distance. Choosing that location is also very important, as it's a part of the process. Hunters need to ensure that they have a clear view and a safe distance to hunt without endangering themselves or other animals around them. At the same time, they also need to identify targets accurately to avoid accidentally shooting at other animals, especially rabbits, which can be unnecessary victims in the process of hunting feral cats. In addition to using hunting tools, Australians use cage traps as well, which are considered a safe measure that does not harm them at all. Installing cage traps to catch feral cats requires caution and an understanding of this animal's behavior. First, you need to choose a suitable installation location, usually near areas where stray cats often appear or around places with signs of them such as footprints or cat feces. Then the cage trap needs to be placed in an airy and safe place, away from risks to humans or other animals. Next, you need to choose the right cage trap and prepare attractive bait such as cat food or a scent that they like. After choosing the bait, you need to carefully place the bait inside the cage to avoid losing its attractiveness. After preparing the bait, it is very necessary to set up the trigger mechanism of the cage trap so that when a stray cat enters, the trap will close itself quickly and safely. Adjusting the trigger mechanism requires sensitivity and checking to ensure the trap operates properly. Net traps are often placed in areas where feral cats often appear, such as areas in the city where cats often go to find food. Traps are often equipped with sensors or infrared lights to activate when feral cats enter the trap area. When feral cats are captured, organizations or government agencies often conduct medical examinations and mark them before releasing them or performing sterilization measures to reduce reproduction. The use of knit traps is an effective method of minimizing the impact of feral cats have on biodiversity and is essential to protecting Australia's wildlife. After feral cats are caught using cage traps, they're often taken to sterilization areas to conduct health checks and determine whether they carry any diseases. The sterilization process not only helps control the increase in feral cat numbers, but also ensures that those released later do not cause a loss of biodiversity or spread of infectious diseases. Neutering has contributed significantly to reducing the number of feral cats each year in Australia. Thanks to the effectiveness of the feral cat management programs. The number of feral cats in the wild has decreased significantly that way, helping the country's ecological balance. This demonstrates the success of using cage traps. Veterinary centers are also interested in choosing sterilization tools from leading companies. Major companies such as Becton Dickinson BD or Medru Tronic 
or 3M, and as it can offer a variety of cat sterilization tools, from separators and sewing needles, to players and forceps. An experienced veterinarian will perform the surgery correctly and minimize risks. Cats need to be fasted from food and water before surgery according to the veterinarian's instructions. So since these solutions have been affecting in preventing the growth of colonies of some invasive species, do you believe in any other better solution? If so, please don't forget to share your comments and opinions down below. Plus, don't forget to share, like, and subscribe to support our channel with our upcoming videos. And lastly, don't forget to share this video with all your friends so that they can watch it and enjoy it as well.